Hello guys, so we are now at Avalanche Summit in Barcelona and we met here with Taran Chitra, who is founder of Gauntlet. Uh, it's a financial modeling uh, platform uh, which uh, uses uh, algorithmic trading techniques uh, to inform on-chain uh, protocol management. Nice to meet you here, Taran. Nice to meet you as well. So can you tell us about your background? How did you get into crypto? Which year was it? Yeah. So, you know, I spent the last 10 years working in um, sort of trading and hardware related industries. But the first time I kind of really got into crypto was in 2011. Um, I was working on building hardware for this like sort of sort of weird sort of physics project. And, uh, you know, we had put out this chip order and the chip order supplier kind of ghosted us for six months. Uh, and then told us, hey, like we'll give you a 10% discount. And that was the first time I heard about Bitcoin because that was when the first sort of hardware miner rigs kind of came out. Uh, that led me to go mine a bunch. I sold it all at the bottom in 2013, uh, but I paid attention since then. Um, and then basically I think 2016 and 17, as proof of stake was really starting to, to grow, I spent a lot of time trying to understand whether, um, you know, the, the sort of like cryptography uh, threat models that people had for Bitcoin and Ethereum still applied and that kind of led me down this path of trying to understand what the financial risks were in these systems similar to how people measure financial risks in in trading um, and yeah long story short that led me to start going on. Yeah, so you didn't get straight away in 2011 <laughs> when you were <laughs> familiar with mining a bit? You know, I think it was also at that time, um, I just didn't, you know, from a lot of perspectives, uh, especially coming from like an academic perspective, most people didn't really believe Bitcoin worked uh, even then because there's sort of this result, these sort of like impossibility results in decentralized systems that say you can't get like all three of these properties uh, that you want ideally in a distributed database. And Bitcoin took a very weird approach to doing it at that time. And no one actually knew how to like formalize the math for that. And so people just were like, okay, there must be some kind of like scam here or it's centralized or something like that. And I think it took until 2015 when people, you know, researchers really were able to actually formalize why it worked. There was a lot of things in the original Bitcoin paper that didn't explain why it works correctly. Uh, and that was like when I was like, okay, there's actually something here. Um, and so, you know, yeah, I should have stayed in early. I should have gotten in earlier. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, were you involved in uh, some other project or is Gauntlet your first venture in crypto? Gauntlet is my first uh, venture in crypto. Um, I, you know, it, we, we are sort of a service provider to DAOs. So we sell services to DAOs of like mm -hmm. monitoring and optimizing their protocols. Um, but I also run a venture fund called Robot Ventures with Robert Leshner from who founded Compound and we invested in basically like 90 plus protocols. Um, a lot of a lot of them actually are launching at the summit, like mm -hmm. layer zero. Um, but yeah. Uh, and uh, how did the idea to start Gauntlet come to you? It came from like looking at how people were writing papers and writing code in 2016 and 17 for building new networks, especially like Polkadot, Cosmos, Solana. Um, this was pre-Avalanche, the Avalanche paper only came out in 2018. Mm -hmm. um, and kind of trying to reason about, hey, like are there financial attacks that you can do against these systems? You know, usually people think about purely cryptographic attacks of like, can I figure out your private key with some mm -hmm. probability? Um, but there's also this whole notion, proof of stake, of can I somehow make a derivative asset that I can aggregate 33% of stake and then take over the network. And so, you know, that wasn't included in the way people were thinking about security and that led me to kind of go down the rabbit hole. And then, you know, then you start finding new problems and crypto has been a, a never-ending set of new problems, uh, which is awesome. Yeah, that's true. And what's your business model? Yeah, so we sell to DAOs, so we, 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 we send recommendations continuously, monitor, you know, we monitor, say, Compound and Aave, mm -hmm. uh, and look for, like, when, hey, they're bad borrowers, all of a sudden we should increase the collateral requirement and send that proposal to governance. Um, and so then DAOs pay us. So you can, you can see, 
you can see all our payments because they're all public. We make a proposal to pay us and, and, and the DAOs pay us. So, so it's like you sent uh, Ava from Soto's place to Soto for a few months back. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So it, it, it's, it's also like optimizing these protocols, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes, you know, in certain market conditions, DeFi protocols should be providing more revenue to liquidity providers. In other market conditions that are very risky, they should actually be trying to be more conservative and, and, and you know, the users of these protocols, token holders, need to actually know when that's happening and, you know, we kind of provide that. So monitor. how the project should uh, leverage the risks? Yeah, so, I mean, I think most of it is figuring out, uh, and so one my talk at the Avalanche Summit was about this, which is like, what are sort of the functions that DAOs, you know, protocol DAOs should think about? And there's really three things. One is risk, one is incentives, and the last is treasury diversification. Mm -hmm. So somehow you can't balance all three perfectly, but you can try to adjust how much you're spending on risk in terms of insurance, how much you're spending on incentives in terms of liquidity mining rewards, uh, customer acquisition costs, uh, and then also how much you're diversifying to kind of keep sort of a longer term view on protocol revenue. Uh, and so being able to kind of balance those three is, is sort of what I think most protocols should be thinking of. And to do that, they need to come up with like a set of metrics that they really care about. And then from there, people like us can help optimize mm -hmm. those metrics. And uh, what is needed for ideal tokenomics? Uh, what should projects uh, take into account when they uh, make their tokenomics? Really thinking about um, whether, you know, whether your protocol is a cash flow protocol and has future revenue versus a protocol that maybe it's not very clear where the revenue is going to come from. Because if you think about it, when you mint your token and your initial inflation, you're effectively paying users now to participate for the right to either future revenue or future growth. And if you think that your protocol is not going to have cash flow for very long, then you actually want to be more conservative. But if you think you're very close to actually having a realization event, then you should be kind of very aggressive. And, you know, I think. We're seeing this, you know, I, I, I can't really comment too much on NFTs because I don't know, I'm not, not very active there, but I think, you know, for things like the Layer Zero launch that we saw today, um, having high inflation was really good because they drove a ton of volume and mm -hmm. TVL. And I think it's, it's really about figuring out when, when you expect a cash flow event to happen. Uh, so can you tell more about Layer Zero? Yeah, so, so, so Layer Zero is a, is a bridge, cross-chain bridge. Um, it's not a fully trustless one. It, has, it does depend on an oracle, but it doesn't make you have synthetic assets. Mm -hmm. And so the synthetic assets can be quite tricky. So for instance, Wormhole, the, the bridge uh, kind of helped created by Jump, had that big $300 million loss yeah. due to the synthetic asset piece. And mm -hmm. so they're just taking a different approach, better UX, but also like less secure and so it'll, it'll be you know I think it, it feels like DeFi was had a big big event in the last few weeks and you know I think cross-chain DeFi you know has mainly been kind of centralized or sort of a pipe dream but I think over the next two years many projects like Nomad, Layer Zero, things like that will be really pushing uh, the boundary on that. And are you bullish on certain layer one, so layer two, so do you think that future is multi-chain? You know, uh, at least from the perspective of Gauntlet, we, we have customers on basically every chain. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, we're looking, we monitor like $38 billion of assets. And looking at the statistics that we have, it's definitely going to be multi-chain. I, I really find it very hard to believe it will be strictly ETH L2s or strictly Solana. I think it's going to be or Avalanche, it, it, it's going to be something where different applications have better performance on different chains and the bridges and other types of cross-chain mechanisms help facilitate moving between those. And all your customers are DAOs, uh, so what advantages and disadvantages of uh, DAOs do you see? Yeah, I mean, I think DAOs have this amazing advantages of capital flow can be much more free. There's no, you don't need to have a company, you don't need to think about hey, am I crossing like international lines when I s send money to someone or I do a loan? Um, but of course, the, the, the disadvantage is it's hard to incentivize people. It's hard to like uh, get people to, to collaborate efficiently. But I think we're, you know, over time, people building DAO tooling, mm -hmm. people like us, people like other protocols, people who are, are selling analytics to DAOs, 
will over time make it a lot easier for people to join and participate and be active in DAOs. And I, I think that's that's sort of the future of the next sort of couple of years is, is like DAO tooling will make it possible for way more people to participate without having to be extreme experts or super in the weeds. Yeah, that's, that's great <laughs> in terms of DAOs. And can you tell more about your activity with uh, Robot Ventures on uh, what type of projects are you focusing? Uh, like uh, which stages do you invest? Yeah, so we mainly invest in the earliest stage. So some, oftentimes we're either the first money in or almost first money mm -hmm. in. Um, you know, we, we, we really focus on things that we understand, which are, you know, Robert found the compound, I found the gauntlet. We're really focused on DeFi stuff. And pretty much, I'd say the majority of our investments are in DeFi or very close to DeFi. Um, anything we do with NFTs has basically been around protocols that make doing financing of NFTs more viable, like fractional. Um, yeah, we've made a lot of investments. You know, we try to be helpful in the sense that, hey, look, we both are founders. We're still running a company. We're not venture investors. We're trying to like get the highest allocation or whatever. We're trying to just be like, you look, know, we've been in the same shoes. Here's the advice we'd give you, and it'll probably be somewhat different than what mm -hmm. normal venture investors do. And so that's that's really our our goal. And uh, what are the most important features for you in the project when you decide whether to invest or not? Yeah, so for me, it's, it's really about technical stuff. Um, you know, my background is, is very technical and I have written a lot of the early research papers in on how DeFi mechanisms work and stuff like that. And so for me, it's like I get excited when I see a new mechanism and I can really start to think about like why does the math for this work like what types of users would use it how would you kind of bootstrap things and if I can kind of see that whole package of things then that's that's really kind of one of the that's really what guides investment um, for me so you know reading people's papers carefully reading their code really kind of like you know spending time with that that's that's for me that's my diligence process it's it's mainly technical so are uh, all projects uh, where Robert Ventures invest as well clients of Gauntlet? Some are, not all, but yeah, there's definitely there's definitely overlap. And can you share some upcoming plans uh, for the development of Gauntlet? Yeah, so we, we have some, some cool new risk products that I think will be coming out that DAOs can use. And uh, you know, right now we have two main things, which is risk management, so optimizing you know these risk parameters, also incentive optimization. So how much should you pay per pool in liquidity mining? Mm -hmm rewards to optimize some metric but uh yeah we have a couple more uh interesting things that i think uh, many DAOs will, will will be interested in not public yet but next couple weeks okay we'll follow that and can you share your thoughts about uh, institutional investments into crypto DeFi? yeah for sure i think the interesting thing is you know today we saw right this goldman sachs changed their website to say like put metaverse on it which is ridiculous <laughs> Uh, uh, but you know, I think I think the interesting thing is institutions want to be in DeFi, but I think they just like don't really know how to. And there's going to be a lot of education that has to happen. And the education has more to do with the fact that, if we're being honest, you're selling to boomers. They don't know how to use Instagram, let alone you know like use a crypto wallet. So you're going to have to like bridge that gap. Uh, and I think that's whenever people say all this, you know, you oftentimes hear the same kind of things like you need regulatory clarity or like whatever for like institutions. Most of that just has to do with the fact that you're selling to like 70 year olds, yeah. you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And what is needed for the mass crypto adoption from both uh, retail and institutional? I mean, just seeing NFTs kind of in spite of them not having that much, you know, usage kind of spark in the imagination of the world. I think experiences where people can like immersively feel the impact of crypto um, more directly will be important. And like DeFi is sort of, you know, the plumbing for that. Mm -hmm. But things on top of that, whether it's games or whether it's um, sort of like other types of experiential things will, you know, be able to, to kind of improve what the internet looks like now. Um, and I, 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 for some reason, I feel like it's mainly gaming and finance that seem to be the leaders. Uh, you know, what the future of like social networks looks like is not clear. I'm not sure if it will be 
crypto based, but there's clearly something that will emerge of that flavor, right? I mean, the fact that NFTs can bootstrap communities effectively means you can bootstrap micro social networks with crypto. And so what that looks like in 10 years is still not to be seen. It's, we still don't know, but we may have a more personalized, localized social networks that come from crypto. And I think that that will be like a big driver of mass adoption. And personally, do you have any NFTs? So I, uh, I used to make generative art. So I, I, I have some generative art NFTs from artists that I'm friends with. But no, no apes, no punks. No, I, you know, I had fun staying poor with not buying them. But I, 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 for me, it's really about supporting artists I love. And if, uh, you know, if it's an artist that I really love, then that's, I, I'm happy to, to buy their NFT. And lastly, can you share some altcoin picks? Mm. I love Osmosis. So uh, yeah, I've invested into him. Yes. <laughs> yeah, uh, actually, your hair looks like in the logo. <laughs> <laughs> I want my, my profile picture on Twitter used to be a Wasmington, the Osmosis mm. uh, person. Uh, in fact, um, you know, the, the founders of Osmosis, one of them is like one, a developer who I've known for five or six years, who I think is one of the smartest people in the space. Mm -hmm. And I think that they are really committed to building a lot of stuff. You know. At Gauntlet, we've written a lot of academic papers on how to improve AMMs and different things you could do to, to make them more efficient. And Osmosis is just, their team is just implementing everything that exists and uh, way faster than everyone. And so, you know, even if the price doesn't always necessarily indicate that, I think they're really amazing. You uh, just hold Gauntlet. Osmosis or you stake on Osmosis? Stake. <laughs> but I think super fluid staking is kind of an interesting idea we'll start I think we'll start seeing more of this blend of DeFi and layer ones mm -hmm. um, but like in Cosmos it's just easiest right now as the place to do it but I think that's going to be kind of a big thing over time any other favorite coins you have well Stargate I guess <laughs> I already said it <laughs> with layer zero so um, yeah Stargate obviously two billion dollars of liquidity in 24 hours I mean yeah, Brian did his talk here yesterday and it was like 20 million dollars so <laughs> so they've had they've had obviously a crazy run up let's see it'll be really cool to see applications that are built on it because it the developer kit experience i think for what they have for cross chain stuff is just a lot simpler um, and i think like you don't have to be as good of a developer you know, i think right now cross chain stuff is yeah you, you kind of have to be a pretty good developer to write a good cross chain application and i think their development kit is way easier um, also excited for Nomad, I, no coin, but they're yet, yeah, but like they are another bridge that's um, coming out. And I think I think the bridges are, in my mind, bridges that have a good tokenomics model will be great picks. Okay, let's see how this project will play out. Thank you for interesting discussion. Thanks. Thank you very much.